Here we go. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the JuntoCast, a podcast presented by the bloggers at earlyamericanists.com. I'm Ken Owen, an assistant professor of colonial and revolutionary America at the University of Illinois at Springfield. And this month I have returned from my break to impose the rightful order of British tyranny back on this podcast. However, given that this month we're going to be discussing popular protests, British tyranny is making me somewhat nervous. I'm joined this month by three others who are currently preparing their assault on Ken Owen's tyranny, sitting in the corner stirring a vat of boiling pitch tar is Michael Hatton. Hello, Ken. Uh, Michael is a PhD candidate and teaching fellow at Yale University. Over in the other corner, stuffing his effigy of Ken Owen, is Roy Rogers. I hope you've got a lot of feathers to fill that thing out. Oh, I do, Ken. Roy is a PhD candidate at the Cooney Graduate Centre and a writing fellow at the New York City College of Technology. Finally, we're joined for the first time today by Liz Kovart, who is currently writing out anti-Ken slogans to affix to the Liberty Tree. Thanks for joining us, Liz. Thank you for having me. Liz earned her PhD at UC Davis, and she is the author of a blog that can be found at uncommonplacebook.com. She's also the host of a new early American podcast, Ben Franklin's World, which I am reliably informed can be found in the iTunes store. In some ways, popular protest is a very familiar part of the story of the American Revolution, and certainly when we think of events like the Stamp Act crisis, or the Boston Tea Party, or the protests in response to the Intolerable Acts, popular protest is an absolutely integral part of the way that the North American colonies prosecuted the revolution and moved towards independence. But in other ways, there are times that popular protest can almost get written out of the story of the American Revolution, particularly when we think a bit too heavily about the role that was played by founding fathers, or if we concentrate too much on the ideas and the constitutional forms that emerged as a result of the American Revolution. And so today on the podcast, we wanted to talk a little bit more about the forms and the process of popular protest in the revolution to shed a bit more light on the variety of ways in which Americans opposed colonial and governmental rule and the way in which those forms and those processes ultimately did feed back into the broader political process. And I think there's two particularly interesting things about focusing on popular protest in quite this manner. Um, One of which is that this can make the revolution seem even more revolutionary once we broaden the range of participants that we consider when writing histories of the revolution, the American Revolution does look considerably broader, considerably more radical in many ways, given the variety of different opinions that were expressed in all these various ways. At the same time, though, it can also make the revolution in some ways seem less modern. And by that I mean that many of the forms and the processes of popular protest actually owed their origins to colonial forms of protest, things that would have been very familiar to those that had lived in the first half of the 18th century and going back into the 17th century and maybe even earlier. The forms of protest used by American revolutionaries would have made sense to their forebears for at least 150 years. And that's where I wanted to start discussion of popular protest today was to think about what protest in colonial America looked like. One form of popular protest that colonists brought with them from Europe was known as rough music. Liz, would you like to tell us a bit more about what rough music actually entailed? Happy to, Ken. 
Europe had a long history of festive processions called cherivari, or rough music. And what those processions did is the community got together and shamed people who had violated community or social norms. And that could be anything from adultery or a woman beat her husband, anything uh, that violated the moral and community norms um, could be protested with this rough music. And while it is called rough music, is because people typically took pots, pans, anything that they really had at their disposal, and took it to their neighbor's house in the middle of the night and started banging them around. Now in England, this process was known as skimmington. And in one example of a skimmington, if you had an, an adulterer or a man that had been cuckolded by his wife, they would have a set of poles and a chemise draped over the poles. And they would put some sort of um, horse head or animal skull with horns on the top of those poles. And people would bang their pots and pans around. And then the neighbors would act out the act that the people were protesting. So if you had a wife that beat her husband or cuckolded him, two neighbors would act out the part of the husband and the wife, and the husband would be made to sit on a donkey or horse backwards, and a wife would take the ladle and start beating the husband on the backwards donkey, whereas he was sitting on the donkey backwards. And this type of community protest is what the colonists in North America looked to when they made riots and protests in their own community. Yeah, one of the things I find very interesting about rough music, Liz, is just how familiar this would have been as well, that we see this tradition incredibly well chronicled in colonial America, but pretty much anyone who stepped across from 18th century Europe would have been unsurprised to find this regulation of social norms taking place. I'm thinking here, my favourite stories from British history in that period are of um, cheapskate young men who would refuse to buy their village a round of drinks when they were getting married and would be forcibly taken from their homes and dragged down to the pub. Um, in quite the in quite the manner that you describe um, to make sure that they kept up that social convention and that the stories that we read in England are remarkably similar in many ways to the stories that we hear in colonial America. So we have these protests that are focused around social norms and social order. But another form of protest that's particularly important in colonial America is that of economic regulation and of ordinary people voicing their concerns about the way in which the economy functions. Michael, I know you had a few examples you wanted to talk about. Right. Thanks, Ken. Uh you know, one example that we have in New York City in the first half of the 18th century are protests that are organized around professions, right, that often target specific uh, municipal economic policies. So uh, the, the city of New York by the 18th century had been incorporated, and so the municipal government enjoyed significant control over the local economy, and they regulated the prices of a number of uh, necessary goods like um, grains, meat, um, tea, wood, things like that. And in the 1730s and 1740s, following a few decades of uh, really rapid expansion of the city's economy, you start to see artisan groups like bakers and butchers uh, responding to what they perceive as unfavorable economic policies by organizing these public protests. So, for example, in 1741, uh, you, ha you have a situation where uh, a number of butchers from outside the city, sort of country butchers, flood into the city and take up a majority of the open stalls at the city market. And because they're non-residents of the city, they're not bound by the same regulations that the city butchers are. And so they don't have to pay a fee for the stalls. And... This led the city butchers to file petitions with the city's common council, and then they eventually staged public protests, where, uh, confrontations really, between them and the country butchers. And these kinds of 
uh, protests eventually forced the council to lower the fee for the stalls and allow the city butchers to lease them for, uh, you know, stretches of time. And so what we see in New York City in the decades before the revolution is a rise in organized public protests that was, you know, largely centered around economic issues. And it happened in the city because the municipal government had enough power to redress their concerns but at the same time was also much more accessible to these kinds of artisans than, say, the, the provincial assembly. Yes, and I think that what you speak to there more broadly is the importance of food and sustenance within early American protest as well. That another very common form of protest that we'd see during the 18th century is that of the food riot. And again, picking up on what Liz said earlier, this is something that is tremendously familiar to those who've studied early modern European or early modern English history as well, that actually these sorts of riots, these sorts of protests are part and parcel of the way that the political system works. And I think there's a couple of things that are interesting there. You know, one, we've talked quite a bit about the political system when talking about this. In theory, a lot of the participants in food riots wouldn't have been able to vote, wouldn't have been able to exercise some formal political voice in a modern sense, but actually these riots are a means through which they're able to influence the political process in some way. The term that historians would normally use to describe that um, would be the exercising of a moral economy. Um, that comes from the work of E.P. Thompson, um, the great English working class historian, and his article, The Moral Economy of the English Crowd. But historians that work on many other countries have found very similar movements taking place elsewhere, and colonial America is no different in seeing that form of economic protest. These protests often had a religious uh, cast as well. Uh, we see this most famously through the ritualistic Pope's Day celebrations, which remembered the failed plot to destroy Parliament. And this, we see a lot of Im anti-Catholic imagery in, in port cities, where each year crowds gathered to sort of celebrate British Protestantism victory over Catholicism. And the religious cast of this, I think, in, over the course of the 17th century became more and more directly political in a day-to-day -day way, where, no, where these religious riots weren't just targeting theoretic Catholic threats back in England or in Europe, but were specifically targeting religious minorities within specific colonies. And we see this very sharply in Maryland, which uh, during the Glorious Revolution saw a huge number of pro-Protestant and anti-Catholic protests, which were launched in support of a Protestant coup that overthrow, overthrew the Calvert regime in Maryland and successfully imposed Protestant rule. It involved a whole variety of crowd actions, seizing, attacking Catholic property, seizing guns from Catholics, specifically targeting this religious minority for a clear political end within the colonies. It was no longer just about making sure that Protestantism would be maintained against Catholic threats. It was physically reinforcing Protestantism against this religious minority. And it wasn't just Catholics that faced this kind of violence. Uh, Quakers and other religious minorities uh, faced this sort of crowd action as well when it was seen as a very concrete political threat to the dominant mainstream Protestantism of the 17th century. And I think it's particularly interesting that you highlight the links between religious and political protest there. Um, as listeners to the podcast will know, I work on Pennsylvania, and one of the things that you see in popular protest in Pennsylvania in the mid-18th century is this combination of religious tension alongside control of the political apparatus of the colony. Um, I'm thinking here particularly of election riots that take place in Philadelphia in the 1740s and 1750s. It's at a time when Quaker dominance of politics is becoming increasingly controversial because of the pacifism 
at a time of feared military invasion and therefore you will find sailors and other people from outside of the Quaker coalition deliberately intimidating the damned broad rims as they go to the polling station to cast their votes. So I think the, the combination of these different types of protest is something that's worth talking about and worth thinking about in terms of colonial protest as well. We've separated it out into social, economic, religious, political, but actually there's an awful lot of overlap between these different types of popular protest. And so I think what we see from this discussion is just how pervasive protest is. One of the key themes that underlies all the different forms of popular protest in the colonial period, be it religious, be it economic, or be it more directly political, is the inversion of social roles. Where if a woman is seen as misbehaving, a man would wear her, dre wear her costume and perform how poorly she was acting to highlight it in, to highlight uh, how she has transgressed society, society's norms, or you can see African Americans taking on white roles in protests or in parades, all meant to highlight the sort of inequalities or the way in which people have transgressed social norms in a really sharp way that in some ways challenges whatever the protest is about, uh, be it an, a food riot or an anti-Catholic riot, but also in some ways ends up reinforcing these sharp social divisions that were ripe in colonial society. And I think another important thing that should be thought of goes back to what you were talking about with the Pope's Day riots. Roy, in that the way that the Pope's Day riots will be funded is that the working men and the working associations that form the groups that create these effigies of the Pope, that put on these elaborate parades, they fund this by going round with a mob, essentially, to the elites within the cities where they live and say, will you give donations for the effigy? With the very clear implication being that if you do not give donations for the effigy, you may well find yourself in need of new windows by the end of the evening. And so there's something involving class here as well, that a lot of these forms of protest are very much those from the lower orders, the lower sorts within society, being able to express some sort of influence, whether that be on social norms, whether it be on the harmonious functioning of the economy, or whether it be on political or religious questions, those questions of class inversion are one of the things that makes these forms of protest quite so potent. Given that protest was such a pervasive form of colonial life in the 18th century, it's perhaps not that surprising that once we get to the end of the Seven Years' War and the Treaty of Paris in 1763, and the subsequent attempts by the British government to impose all kinds of new imperial legislation on the colonies that colonists turn to these forms of protest as a means of trying to stop the British Parliament from taking actions that it seems as illegitimate. Perhaps it's best if we start off by trying to give some flavour of what this popular protest actually looked like. Now, when we think of popular protest in the American Revolution, the traditional story often begins in 1765 with the British Parliament's passage of the Stamp Act. But actually, there were stirrings of protest throughout in the American colonies before 1765. And Liz, I know that you've done some work on protest before 1765. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Beginning in 1763, Albany actually faced two types of imperial crisis, and the major source of imperial crisis actually was one of identity. Throughout the French and Indian War, the French, uh, British Army had called Albany home. They even quartered their troops into the people's houses um, to help them get to the front faster during the after winter. And the British had questioned the Albanians' identity, and the Albanians are what the people of Albany called themselves. 
The people of Albany mostly were descended from the Dutch from New Netherlands, and as a result, they tended to dress a little differently than Britons from England. Their architecture looked more like Dutch buildings in Amsterdam than buildings in London. Um, so after the French and Indian War in 1763, the Albanians start to address this crisis of identity. And one way that they start to do that is, is they mimic dress. They mimic architecture. They start building buildings in the Georgian style, and they rename their streets after famous British generals who had been victorious in the French and Indian War. But something else that they do is they also riot. On May 23rd, 1763, Mayor Fulkert P. Dow led an attack against the Army's storehouse. They weren't looking to attack the soldiers. They were looking to make a statement by attacking the building. And what the Albanians were trying to protest was they needed their land back. After the French and Indian War, they have a huge population boom because all of the soldiers and several of the New Englanders had seen not only the land in New York, but the fur trade, and they wanted in on it. So they're moving into the Albany area, and the people of Albany need their land back. So they want the army to move out, but the army says no. So what you get in Albany is between 1763 and 1767, you get eight riots, or what General Gage classified as mob actions. Now, five of those riots looked exactly like the storehouse incident. They attacked the Army's buildings. But two of those riots actually occurred against military personnel. And just to give you a flavor of what they were, one of the most famous riots of that is on March 8, 1764. Lieutenants Gillen and Godwin go down to Albany, where after having some drinks at Colonel John Bradstreet's house, they wander da into downtown Albany. They knock on some door where they have some, quote, female acquaintance, and they ask her if the, she doesn't, ha you know, she, if she won't let them in and, and give them some drink. She says no, and she calls next door for help, where a parcel of Dutchmen came out, and they start attacking the troops. Now, the two officers go back to the barracks. Their men are astonished to see them all beat up, and it's a source of pride. So the men go out to defend their officers. And before the night is over, there's a huge street brawl. No one is ever prosecuted. And this is a common theme. The British don't prosecute the Albanians. The Albanians don't prosecute the British in these riots. What I do find interesting, though, is that the crisis of identity in Albany seems to take precedence over the crisis of imperial taxation, where in Boston in August 1765 they protest the Stamp Act. They don't protest the Stamp Act in Albany until January 1766. I think it's particularly interesting that you talk about the targeting of property there, Liz, because that's something that we definitely see within the Stamp Act as well, that in 1765, Bostonians and people in other colonies develop a ritualised form of protest against the Stamp Act. And in Boston, the Boston Common, the Liberty Tree become a very important focal point for popular protest. In other areas, we might see mock trials for liberty being held. The protests take a more targeted turn, beginning in August 1765 in Boston, there are two incidents of particular note. The first targets Andrew Oliver, who has agreed to be the Stamp Act Commissioner for Massachusetts, and a mob tears down the warehouse at which he was planning to set up his stamp office, and they also attack Oliver's house as well, and in the process force Oliver to resign. And that deliberate attacking both of personal property and the person of Oliver, their very serious threats thrown out towards Oliver, begins to provide a model through which people are able to protest those who take an office that seems to be against the will of the public. A second riot is that that takes place against Thomas Hutchinson, noted supporter of the Stamp Act and Chief Justice of Massachusetts. Uh, that riot has always been a little more controversial 
within both contemporary opinion and the opinion of historians that have written afterwards, because no one's quite sure exactly who orchestrated the movement and exactly why Hutchinson's house was attacked. But we do see a really important shift in protest in August from some of these more ritualised forms that might harken back to earlier forms of protest to a very specific targeting of people that were planning to help enforce the new law. Right. We sort of have a similar targeting and a similar uh, situation in New York City in November of 1765. You know, Thomas Hutchinson, a a large part of the reason why he was targeted was that, uh, you know, he had built up a lot of ill will over time as lieutenant governor. uh, And that sort of comes to a head during the imperial crisis. We see a similar thing in New York uh, in November, uh, you know, when New Yorkers go after the uh, the lieutenant governor, but who's actually the acting governor at the moment, uh, Cadwallader Colden. I mean, in Pauline Mayer and from Resistance to Revolution, you know, she describes the Stamp Act riots in various colonies. And she says that none of them came as close to anarchy as the ones that ha- the one that occurred in New York. And the main riot there happened on November 1st. So that's the day the Stamp Act is supposed to take effect. And, you know, New Yorkers had already read reports of the riots in Boston uh, on Oliver and on, on Hutchinson. And in the weeks leading up to the first, the, the acting governor, Colden, and a British military officer, there's a British regiment there, Major James, right? They're both quoted in the paper saying that they're going to enforce the act, much as much as Hutchinson had done. And James actually is quoted in the newspaper as saying that he's going to cram the stamps down the citizens' throats. And so they're already targets well before the riot began, much like Hutchinson. And on that night, the, the two of them are basically hiding out in Fort George, which is where the governor's residence is. And the inhabitants of the city, they, they parade through the streets with effigies of Colden and the devil. And then along the way, they break into his carriage house and destroy his carriage. They carry the wood down to Bowling Green, which is outside of Fort George. And they use the wood from the carriage to burn the effigies right in front of the fort so that Colden can be looking out and see them doing this. And then they nail a letter to the to the fort gate to Colden uh, telling him basically that he's, he will, quote, surely be put to death if he tried to use the army against the people. And then they finish the night off by basically tearing down Major James's home. So like the riots in Boston, these riots are violent and you know destructive, targeting individuals and private property, and would have escalated into a, you know a street war if he'd not been smart enough to hide out in the fort and do nothing. And I think that you know the the sort of anger that you see in documents from things like the Stamp Act Congress and uh, things like that, you know, that's rhetorically florid, I guess. But the the anger on the streets. In Boston, in New York, we see it in Connecticut, throughout the colonies, really, in the fall and into the winter of 1765, was really visceral. And, and I, th- I think it's exacerbated by the fact that most urban areas of the colonies were already engulfed in this post-Seven Years' War economic recession, or uh, effectively a depression. Uh, when these armies left the cities, you know, that caused se- severe economic distress. And I really think that, you know, you, you have to keep that in mind when you're talking about these popular actions during the period, because it's really, I think, the, the foundation for understanding the, the, the popular anger. Michael, it's a really interesting point that you make. And one th- thing that we never really think about in our popular imagination of what these riots was like was how scary they were. I mean, people in New York City must have experienced fear. Colden must have experienced fear that these rioters were going to get them, which is not something you would have seen when the community came to your door with their pots and pans banging them and getting ready to reenact, you know, whatever adultery or uh, cuckolding event that they were protesting. Right. I mean, I think that's absolutely the point, right, is, you know, the, the, the moral economy protests that we're talking about before, you know, they're organized, they're orchestrated, but they're orchestrated in a way that they're going to be relatively safe. Right. And but the the thing that's significant about these protests in 
Boston in New York and then throughout the rest of the colonies is they're still orchestrated to an extent, right? But they're very much crossing a line that goes beyond the protests that we see in the moral economy, right? This is, there is a, a willingness here to target individuals and to destroy individuals' property, right? That is, that is something new in terms of the, the, the popular protests that we don't see in those moral economy protests in the earlier colonial period. What do you think accounts for that transition, that shift from organized to unruly and fearsome? I mean, I mentioned this before, but I think that really, oh, I mean, it maybe doesn't account for all of it, but but certainly part of what's accounting for the sort of visceralness of these of these protests and and the the, the targeting of property really has to do with the sort of economic circumstances that these urban uh, towns and cities are facing by the end of 1765. Right. The, the soldiers have been withdrawn. These army regiments have been withdrawn. So there's severe economic depression. There is uh, currency shortages. Uh, people are suffering. Jobs have been lost. And that can serve as, you know, a sort of jumping off point for things to take a different turn than they would have before. And, and not just the internal economic circumstances, but, you know, there's the imperial economic circumstances of, of you know, economic policies being imposed from without, basically from the metropole. When I'm talking about the bakers in 1730s and 1740s, they're facing economic policies, they're protesting economic policies, but they know that they have the chance of having those redressed because they're being uh, created and enforced on a local level. I think in some sense, to account for the way that these protests in 1765 get out of control really says something about the, the, the lack of control or the lack of ability to really effectively redress these policies, you know, on the part of a broader public, as opposed to elites who are sending, you know, petitions and things like that to Britain. I'm going to come in and wave my skeptics flag here, um, and I'll leave you to decide how much that flag looks like a Union Jack. But I think you're really selling the importance of political ideas short here, insofar as a lot of the protests that we talked about in colonial times have very specific stimuli, but we can account for them fairly easily as well. You know, prices of bread have risen su suddenly, therefore people want to reduce the price of bread. I think when we look, particularly with what Liz has said about what's going on in Albany, and if we were to look elsewhere with other pe parts of British legislation, like the Proclamation Line, like the Sugar Act, there's really an importance here in the way that the political system is expected to work as well. And it's not obvious what the channels of redress are, particularly when the British Parliament has said so clearly, we have the right to do this. You know, we're not acting in an unconstitutional manner. And I think one of the things that sets the Stamp Act apart from earlier forms of protest is that there really is something that's beginning to approximate a coherent set of ideas about representative government that is emerging in this anger. And one of the reasons that there's the viscerality that you talk about, Michael, I think, is because there's a feeling that, no, we had a system worked out. It was supposed to work that we had a voice in this way. And you've just completely disregarded that. Partly uh, what, what you're saying is actually not, I don't think, that different from what I'm saying. I think that in those earlier things like bread rights, those people have a history of having those local issues locally redressed, right? And I think that part of the, the visceralness of it can be accounted for uh, by the frustration of the moment and the, the political uncertainty that the, the that the situation is creating, right? They, I mean, they are used to a certain they are used to a certain constitutional arrangement, as Jack Green would probably put it. And uh, yeah, I think that there's the frustration and there's uncertainty. I don't think it's just one or the other. I think what makes the particularly destructive nature of the popular protests of the imperial crisis and the early American Revolution both similar but also different from earlier forms of protest is that politics, both crowd politics and high politics became overheated for a longer, more extended period of time than any other period in British North American history. If we look at the most uh, 
dangerous, most upsetting, most destructive, popular protests, riots of the colonial period, it was all when politics became overheated because of the Glorious Revolution, because of the threat of invasion, over for a short period of time. But what I think makes the imperial crisis different is these reoccurring ra- waves that refuse to fundamentally resolve this conflict in a way that is at all a return to either the status quo or what the protesters want. And that, I think, is where the break begins with the colonial period. We can really see a new form of popular politics emerge is because of just how protracted the imperial crisis is compared to other political crises that beset British North America. Two things. One, for, for Ken, I think that in, the, in terms of political ideas, right, I think that that is something the, in, in the way that you're talking about it that does come to matter and that does come to factor in. I don't think necessarily that that's a factor as early as the fall of 1765. I think they're reacting at that point rather than, you know, sort of uh, thinking – thinking things through in a constitutional manner. And I mean, popularly speaking, but, but also to Roy's point, I think there's something to that. that to the fact that this is a, a that this is a, prota- a protracted period of sort of uncertainty and instability, but I, you know, it's interspersed with periods where, uh, you know, with briefer periods where that's not the case. I'm just curious because, you know, one of the themes that keep coming up is fear of uncertainty, fear of losing local control and like you said, Ken, that the British government is changing the terms um, in terms of the way governance and things are done. But couldn't it also be, you know how the, the I forget what year it happens, but William Pitt secures the colonial armies, you know, their officers will, to a certain extent, will have equal status and their bills will be paid. And so the colonists jump into the war wholeheartedly and... They really vested in it. So to have Parliament come down on them and change the terms of agreement, I think they probably got the idea that things would be more equal than they were after the war. And I think there may be pent up anger over that. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that, that there's a feeling of greater self-confidence in the colonies by 1763 that seems to be frustrated. I think another thing that's worth bearing in mind is just how successful fear and anger is, that they tear down Oliver's warehouse and get him to resign. There's a host of other Stamp Act commissioners that then resign because elites in those colonies go to the commissioners and say, look, if you don't give this up pretty quickly, you know what's going to happen to your house, don't you? And therefore, there isn't even the need to have this sort of protest in some colonies because people see what's going to happen and step back from the sort of action that they might have taken. And so I don't want to underplay the role of fear and that sense of instability. Um, But I think a lot of what we've talked about here does emphasise that it's not just the economic circumstances that matter. It's that there is a much broader sense, whether it's in a sense of British identity, whether it's in a sense of underlying political structures, whether it's in a sense, and I think your point, Roy, about the fact that this doesn't go back to the status quo, but it also leaves the outcome very constitutionally ambiguous, um, is is a source of tension that means that protest is beginning to take on a different form. There's two things, I think, that come out of our discussion of the Stamp Act here that are historically significant for the way that the revolution proceeds, one of which is a shift from protest being primarily local to protest that is aimed at a much wider audience, whether it's aimed at influencing Britain, whether it's aimed at uniting people from the various colonies together. When people start protesting after 1765, it's with a much broader purview than when they protested prior to 1765. And I think another thing that's important here is that to think about the way that that works, there is both the energy that was unleashed by the almost simultaneous local protests in 1765, but also the sense that there might be a need for greater organisation. 
Right. Well, you start to see that, I think, you know, when you get to the the non-importation, which is a response to the Townsend Acts in 1767, and that goes on through 1770, right? There's a there's an effort to channel this this energy of popular resistance into a less destructive and less anarchic sort of form of resistance. And you see that in the way that, uh, you know, ordinary colonists are brought in to support things like non-importation by going around and getting people to sign subscription lists, by signing those subscription lists. And I think it's in that period, it's a strategy that really tried to involve a lot of people by turning everyday tasks like shopping and things like that into meaningful political acts. And so you have the combination of that street energy and the previous organization of the more um, elite resistance. So I think that probably, you know, between 1767 and 1770, popular resistance in some sense becomes domesticated, right? But in a way that genuinely empowers common people to participate politically. And I think, you know, that's going to have consequences down the road. You raise a good point, Michael. Um, I read somewhere that the Sons of Liberty were actually created to try and bring organization to the disorder of those mobs. And one way you can see that, as well as examples of spreading Um, political participation is with the Tea Party. We all know that on December 16th, 1773, the Patriots dropped 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor to protest the Tea Act. But what many people don't know is that Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty debated what to do over the Tea Act for over a month. They met in the Old South Meeting House. They invited everybody in Boston, well, at least white men, Um, to participate in these debates, even if they couldn't vote in Boston elections. And I think it's something that you see not just in in Boston, but in the way that other colonies protest and block the enforcement of the Tea Act as well. That in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, this is pretty much entirely enforced by the creation of voluntary committees. That if we go further south into Charleston, the they're actually forced in a kind of strange situation to allow the tea to come into the harbour to avoid destroying it in the way that they did in Boston, but then appoint and organise a consistent watch to make sure that no one tries to take the tea, to make sure that no one tries to sell the tea, and to certainly make sure that no one ever pays one penny of tax on that tea that's been imported. And so we can see that there's a very careful organization of the of that sort of resistance that provides an organizational structure when you get later into 1774 and the news of the intolerable acts reaches the colonies as well there is already a structure in place that is ready to protest and is ready to coordinate the protests so that even though they might have a lot of local energy they're all more or less acting in concert with one another Right. You have that in New York, you know, the, you, the, the Committee of Mechanics are formed um, around 1774. And then, of course, you know, the Continental Association effectively makes use of all these local committees that are that have been formed, these popular local committees. And, and so, uh, you know, there's a there's a situation where by by the end of 74 and into early 75, you have a Continental Congress that is starting to be able to harness the power of the this more popular organization than existed in the the 1760s. And after the popular committees, you have the Continental Army and militia units. I mean, the violence against people doesn't go away. It just gets transferred into the war. And indeed, in some ways, the violence does continue against people as well. You you read through the diaries of elites, especially elite Quakers in Philadelphia, and they will regularly have their windows smashed or people coming around demanding payment for the upkeep of the association or for supplies for the militia. In other places, you might see, you know, in Boston, you'd see the tarring and feathering of John Malcolm. In in one other incident, you might be made to ride the rails. Or my favourite story from this period is from someone who is 
carried around from town to town, tied up in the belly of an ox. Again, for that social ostracism to point out that this person, in his support of the British, is acting against the norms of the community. You know, even though that we're talking about organisation and in some ways a much clearer way in which this protest can be channelled, it does also involve a huge amount of violence that's directed towards those that aren't participating wholeheartedly in resistance to Britain as well. And don't forget the largest form of public ostracism. If you're a loyalist, many of the states develop property confiscation acts and take your property away. What's interesting to me, and I think is a very open question, is, is this transition over the 1770s that we see really beginning with the Sons of Liberty and the Boston Tea Party, and as the Sons of Liberty grow more, uh, spread throughout the colonies and grow more politically powerful, and we see the, establish, the establishment of these committees of safety, which become local governments, which then become these new state governments, and we see a sort of militarization of the violence against people of property, both in the form of the militia and the form of confiscation, is is something lost as there's this move towards popular violence becoming state or military violence? Is there a, a freedom of popular protest that is lost as the revolution becomes increasingly focused on state and institution building? A kind of form of popular protest that when we emerge out of the American Revolution, once uh, independence is gained from Britain doesn't come back. There's that this cologne that the revolution as it institutionalizes itself through things like the Sons of Liberty, through committees of safety, through state governments, and then eventually to a national government. Is there a fundamental loss of the rights of local people to these sort of forms of, pro of protest that we talked about at the beginning of today? It probably won't surprise you, Roy, to that I think that the period of the 1780s and the 1790s really does show the importance of popular protest and something that is of foundational importance within the constitutional settlements that end up being negotiated in the 1780s and 1790s. One reason for this is that I think the pervasiveness of protest actually increases. You know, we talked about how pervasive protest was in the colonial period, but during the revolution, as Michael talked about with the domestication of protest, there are all sorts of acts that now become very specifically political. And if you look through the annals of the revolution, you'll find that subscription books, people know that these are political. When they have someone that comes around with a subscription that says, will you pay for the poor of Boston? You know, if you respond in a violent manner, the Committee of Safety will then haul you up for having spoken in an intemperate manner. You know, people know that these things are political, and therefore, even into the 1780s, 1790s, those sorts of actions are imbued with political significance. The other thing that I think is really, really important to bear in mind, and it's one of the reasons that I wanted to set up this discussion by emphasising the long-lasting nature of protest, and the familiarity of a lot of these forms to people, not just in the 1770s or the 1780s, but also going back to the 1680s, or maybe even earlier, is that these forms of political protest are in many ways considerably more historically legitimate than any new form of government. Now, I think you're getting at that with the question that you ask, because you realise that that is actually something that is a potential source of threat and instability to the new order that has been set up. But at the same time, you're going to have a very difficult job of persuading people that these forms of protest are no longer legitimate just because there's been some change in the form of government. And indeed, we see that. You know, we see it in the language of Shays' rebellion. When different forms of protest fail, they have the right to try and seize control of the government. We see it in the Whiskey Rebellion, you know, that um, the language of the protesters has been, we've petitioned government, we've tried low-level forms of resistance to the excise tax, we've tried social ostracism of those that wanted to form the excise tax, we've voted in elections, we've written to newspapers, we've done absolutely everything that you say is the way that you get things changed, and it still hasn't worked. We've got the right to these forms of action, we're going to continue to do it. So no, I don't think it gets lost. I think it's a very important way in which those who might not be 
directly pulling the levers of government, still managed to exert an enormous amount of influence in constraining the way that government actually operates. And of course, uh, you know, the, there's a there's a continuation there in a sense that right Shays and even during the Whiskey Rebellion are drawing on ideas about protests from the revolutionary period and from the imperial crisis. Right. And so the, seeing themselves sort of in that, uh, seeing their actions as being legitimate uh, in the face of in the face of what's come before, it seems to me that there's a uh, that there's a connection there. You, whether you can argue that that is a sort of continuous connection, I think Ken is saying, or whether it's something that that goes latent or something that needs to be brought back out after the transition to state government that Roy is talking about, I think that's very much up for debate. But I think there, you know, the connection is clear. It's just a ma it's just a matter of whether that connection is continuous or whether it goes latent for a while and comes back after the war. I think what's going on in the 1770s, but particularly in the 1780s and the 1790s, is not so much that these older forms of political protest go away entirely, but rather that the po the acceptable political space for these forms of protest is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Where, what, as Michael said earlier, and I think it's a really good point, the domestication of popular protest that occurs in the, you know, with the non-importation uh, movement, that is, the political space for those forms of political engagement is going to grow and grow and grow over the course of the late 18th century and take off in the 19th century and continue to today, but the more violent, the moral economy of the crowd forms of political protest, or even things as extreme as Shays and the Whiskey Rebellion, the political space where that's considered acceptable both by elites and even by many more common white Americans, that political space is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And it might expand again in the 1830s and then shrink again, but I think that there is a fundamental break where this, domestic, this domestication of popular politics, and we can eventually add in the 19th century religious organizations which use these forms of, of politics and make them even more popular, make them even more tools of the common people than they were necessarily in the 1770s and the, the 1760s, is really going to limit the kind of rabble political protest that was so common in the colonial period through Pope's Day, through, you know, riding people out of town, through all of these varieties of forms of things that we started with today. Your point about domestication is well taken, Roy, but I think you're selling it short. You know, if we're looking at why a lot of these protests take the form that they do in the colonial period, it's because there really is a sense of powerlessness that, you know, unless you go and destroy the mill or something like that, you're not going to be able to exert a serious amount of pressure on the price of bread or something like that. The fact that there are all these other avenues that open up during the course of the revolution as avenues of popular protest is definitely an enormous win for the rabble as well as for others who fall somewhere between the rabble and the elite that actually have new avenues that allow them to communicate in different ways with the governmental orders that exercise protest over them. So I think the first point is domestication doesn't necessarily mean that something's being lost or something's being closed off. And I think part of this comes back to one of the problems that I have with the moral economy, which is that I think it sort of sees the those that engage in food riots as having some form of anti-capitalist class consciousness rather than looking at the immediate stimuli for their protest. The fact is that when I look at the 1780s and the 1790s, I see an enormous amount of incidents in which popular protest really does change the way and change the actions of government. We can look at that with the Bill of Rights. If it wasn't for anti-federalist protest, both in domesticated and in violent forms, there wouldn't have been... Um, f f there wouldn't have been a Bill of Rights. We can look at it with things such as the debates over the Jay Treaty, as well as in more violent protests like Shays and the Whiskey Rebellion. Now, clearly, 
the government is going to try and frame this in a different way. And I think one of the difficulties that we have in trying to pass out some of these things is that people who have enthusiastically participated in protest when they want to overthrow the British government suddenly dislike popular protest when it's their neck on the line. And that because a lot of these people that were protesters in the 1770s suddenly become the more reactionary in the 1790s, it seems like maybe there's been some pushback. But to me, if we keep our focus largely on those that are opposing the actions of government, we see an enormous vitality in protest that stretches from some very sophisticated election campaigns um, that are coordinated on a much larger scale than any election campaign prior to the, to the revolution, um, through pamphleteering, through the organisation of civil disobedience, you know, I think Terry Bowden's work on road closures would be one way of looking at that. Michael McDonald's work on militia protests would be another way of looking at that. Um, through to the outbreaks of, of more violence. And to me, it's that range that really cements the importance of popular protest. It doesn't always have to take the form of violence, but it certainly is present and that idea of crowd action or popular action or just sheer weight of numbers adding legitimacy to what you do is a really important factor in deciding what government can and can't do both on a state and national level into the 1790s. And so to make that continuation argument on a broad scale, what we see by the time we get to the 1790s is that the legitimacy of numbers that we see in the protests like those of the moral economy in the 18th century, and then the idea of the legitimacy of violence and specific targeting that we outlined as developing in the 1760s in some ways has combined by the time that we get to the 1790s. So rather than dissipating, we're actually seeing a lot of these different forms of protests combining and coming together to provide opportunities to oppose governments rather than closing off avenues. Obviously, with a topic like popular protest, there's so much more that we could discuss. But I think that brings us to a natural ending point for today's discussion. And I'm sure in future podcasts, we will touch on protest again. Thanks to my fellow panellists for joining me today. That's Michael Hattam. Thank you, Ken. Roy Rogers. Thanks, Ken. And Liz Covart. Thank you, Ken. On the website earlyamericanists.com, we will be putting up a further reading list so that you've got more idea of where to take your study of the subject of popular protest further. And indeed, we strongly encourage you to visit the website earlyamericanists.com, where you will find a range of early American historical goodness. If you want to follow updates from the podcast, you can subscribe to us in iTunes by searching for the Junto cast, or you can follow us on Twitter by using the handle at Junto cast. If you like what you've heard on the podcast today, please get in touch with us at using the email thejuntoblog at gmail.com. And if you want updates from the Junto's blog more generally, you should follow us on Twitter with the handle at the Junto blog. Once you've finished listening to the Junto cast's back episodes, you should also check out Liz's podcast, which it can be found at the website www.benfranklinsworld.com. Unless my fellow panellists decide to emulate George Washington and attack me in my sleep on Christmas morning, we'll be back in the new year with more episodes of the Junto cast. Thanks for listening to this episode, and we hope you'll join us next time. <laughs> <laughs>